team of Cosmo Quest Astro 101. I am your host, Dr. Matthew Richardson, and um, unfortunately, Joe can't be with us again today. Um, this time, he's not feeling too well, so we're all kind of sending our prayers out to him for his, his stomach bug. Right, He has a stomach bug right now. Hopefully, it gets better soon. But um, I want to say quickly, thank you, Dr. Plazas, for another great daily space news update. And... I'm going to go ahead and just get started with what we're talking about today, guys. Um, we're going to be talking about neutron stars. But before getting into that, let me just do some quick stuff, more technical stuff with my computer here. I tried to turn some knobs to hopefully make it a little bit better with being able to support the streams. All right. But hey, guys. Hey, Astro. Hey, Larry. Just calling out some of the people's names I see kind of in the chat right now. All right. So we're talking about neutron stars. And so here in the background, I'm showing an, a Wikipedia image of a field that has a neutron star within it, where we're kind of seeing the effects of the neutron star on essentially the light coming from the field. Um, this is a Wikipedia image. You guys can always just type in neutron stars and it'll be Wikipedia and it'll be this will be like the first image that pops up. But given that we're talking about neutron stars, I kind of figured it'd be best to kind of start off with talking about exactly how are neutron stars born. And somewhere within this explanation, I'm going to get into exactly what a neutron star is, but how are they born? So the story actually kind of begins well, well before. <laughs> well before what we're kind of seeing here depicted in this slide. So we're going to start off with, of course, the um, the main sequence star that produces these um, neutron stars. Um, the main sequence stars themselves are typically within the mass range, um, starting as low as eight solar masses, all the way up to about somewhere between 20 to 25 solar masses. And so you start off with this, this main sequence star that, of course, is burning hydrogen onto helium within its core. Eventually, it, it, it finishes burning its hydrogen to helium, and you're basically left with a helium core. At this moment, you, you've moved away from the main sequence, and you're now within the regime of the HR diagram, which we, just, which we talked about in our previous... Um, discussion in, in, our, in our last stream, but if you want me to recover it, of course, I, I'd be more than happy to. But we're, we're now within the regime of the HR diagram, where we're in the giant the giant section of, um, of the HR di diagram. And that's kind of where the story begins with the diagram that we're seeing here. So on the very far left, we kind of have this first box that at the very bottom says implosion. Well, we're not quite at the implosion yet. So we've just made we've just made our eight somewhere between eight to twenty solar mass star in main sequence star into a giant star, a giant, a red giant. And so, for it, while it's in this phase of its um of its lifetime, it what begins to happen is that it undergoes within its core um, burning higher and higher mass um, elements to kind of stave off the effect of it in this case, imploding on itself. Eventually, it'll get to the point where it's burning iron within its core. And we're well, not burning iron, excuse me. It's burned all of its elements up to iron within its core, and it can no longer fuse any more elements that are of higher atomic mass than iron. At this moment, we have an implosion. The, the star essentially collapses on itself. And in this process, we produce what's known as a super, well, in this process, we produce what's known as a supernova type 2 explosion, which is kind of, which is being shown in the um, center box, center frame of our, of our diagram here. And finally, over, over some period of time, what happens is the outermost layers of our, from our supernova explosion are blown away, producing a supernova remnant. And what's left at the very center of, of, um, of this explosion is essentially our neutron star. And so 
Once we produce our neutron star, we'll have something that looks kind of like this. And so this is actually a nice little animation I found online. And so this is our neutron star now. Basically a ball, primarily composed of neutrons, um, for the most part. A really fast spinning ball of, of neutrons, essentially, that has these beams of light coming out of um, at opposite ends of, 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 this, of, of the sphere. Now, the orientation of which the beams are at heavily depends on the um, dynamics of the system when it underwent its when it underwent the supernova explosion but um for the most part we're having this rapidly spinning ball the rapid spin is due to the to, due to the fact that when it was undergoing its formation the um the mass that, that composes the neutron star underwent this collapse and essentially to conserve angular momentum it, it sped up it's kind of like the situation of if you see a, a, a figure skater sk skating and they go into a spin, as they bring their arms inward, they spin faster and faster. That's because their mass distribution is, is getting closer and closer to the um, rotation axis, which is pretty much the exact same thing that happens with, for the most part, that happens with um, a neutron star. Now, I've read that, that, that these um, neutron stars can um, have rotations that are almost comparable to like the blades within a blender, which is insanely fast. But um, along with this rapid um, um, this rapid spinning, they also have a, a very strong magnetic field, and it's from these two different um, characteristics of the neutron star that we're able to produce these streams um, of radio emission that we're seeing within our with, um, as beams of light that come out of our neutron star. However, if we were to go ahead and try to see what, 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 what the neutron star looks like on its interior, we can kind of open it up a little bit, and we'd see something that kind of resembles this. So, um, one thing that I should note is that these neutron stars are, are highly compact objects, meaning that they have very high densities. Um, their masses are somewhere within the range of about I think it was I think I've seen like somewhere like about around probably 1.5 solar masses to two solar masses the range might be a little bit more um, might be larger than that slightly larger than that but I think that's pretty close to it um, and their physical size is somewhere on the order of tens of kilometers um, so if you could think about this um, uh, essentially a, a star um, that has a mass that is comparable to or slightly larger than the mass of our Sun However, you've taken all of that mass and you've condensed it to a, a, to a volume that has a radius of like 10 kilometers. That's a highly dense object compared to our sun, which of course has one solar mass, and it has a physical radius somewhere around 700 kilometers, 700,000 kilometers, excuse me. So these are very, these are very, very highly um, compact or dense objects. And as we're kind of seeing here, um, this is the um, it, this is basically the, the interior structure of, of a neutron star, where of course it has an inner and outer core like most um, like most other stars that, that we've discussed in the past. Um, but as you move out from there, you move to what's considered to be a crust for the star, uh, and then finally you get to an atmosphere. Now one of the one of the interesting interesting things I learned about neutron stars is that their atmospheres are extremely thin. I mean, like an inch thick, which is insane to me um, for 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 the atmosphere of a star. Um, other key things about a neutron star. I think I think I've covered what I wanted to to primarily state say so far for neutron stars as far as their solar interior and some of their um their their, their key characteristics. Well, no. Also, there's the fact that that they're these are, are these are considered to be dead stars, um, or they are dead stars, meaning that they're no longer fusing anything within their core, and so whatever temperature that they started off started out with when they were first formed is the maximum temperature that they'd more than likely ever be. Um, so over time, what will happen is the the rotation of the neutron star will decrease and this will cause 
this will this will um cause a dimming of course of the beams of the, the that are that are coming out of the neutron star but also over time they'll cool and so um eventually they they'll get to the point where they're no longer visible and this is the effect this effect isn't isn't what occurs with um with white dwarfs but white dwarfs themselves also are another type of dead star and they they, they as well no longer are fusing anything within their cores and they too also undergo a cooling process which also corresponds to them physically dimming um as far as their physical luminosity is concerned and so i want to take a quick moment to just pretty or not pretty but like quickly look at comments to make sure I'm not missing anything here so astro acts given the small size of, of the neutron star is the shallow atmosphere proportional to other stars I don't think it is um, <laughs> given the, the physical size it will let me think about that actually I don't think it is and to be very honest I don't know the, the I don't know the answer to this but let's see but then that would require for me to know exactly how I'm trying to think of our own Sun I know that it has a radius of 700,000 kilometers but I don't exactly know how thick its atmosphere is um, that being it, it the atmosphere of the Sun would encompass the CTC Corona transition zone and the chromosphere and photosphere if I'm not mistaken and I'm not too sure exactly above the photospheric level how 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 thick the atmosphere is but if you take the atmosphere of um of for example for the neutron star which is like an inch thick so let's say like about 2.5 centimeters and you're comparing that to its physical size its radius which is like um, on the order of like 10 um, 10 um 10 kilometers I think that's an insane um, difference in you know as far as the ratio is concerned between the two but to be honest I don't know the answer to your question I don't think it I don't think this is comparable to other types of stars but if it is that would be quite interesting Corona of our star can go out to eight million kilometers. Oh, okay, that's that's actually giving us some good numbers there. Thanks, Astro. Um, but quickly moving on to our to my next point, and um in in today's topic. Sorry, guys. For some good reason, my laptops chargers is not working as it should i think it has a shortened line somewhere all right so exactly how do we detect these um these neutron stars so it's one of two methods that one can use to be able to detect these stars and the very first method i'm going to kind of display here imagine yourself sitting on the shore and every now and then you see a beam of light shining at you well a similar effect, of course, will happen with neutron stars. In particular, a partic in particular, a certain class of neutron star called a pulsar. And so, what essentially happens is that if the plane in which the um, the beam, the radio beams of light coming out of the out of our neutron star is aligned with our line of sight, we can see the pulses coming from the from the, from the from the neutron star or the pulsar just like you would see the beams of light coming from a lighthouse which is the reason why I've put pulsars are kinda of like the lighthouses of the universe um, and this is this is by one means in which you could you could detect them um, neutron stars or pulsars which are a type of neutron star that's, that's heavily dependent upon the orientation of um, its its beam axis for for lack of better words I don't even know if beam axis is actual or real term used with, with neutron stars but I'm using it right now and the other means of detecting it of course is if it lies within the binary system so um, interactions between the, the neutron star and its companion 
will of course change the um the radiative properties of the of light coming from the the the, the, the region surrounding the, the binary star system um and i think the typical types of of interactions that are that would occur between the neutron star and its companion would more than likely be that a mass is being accreted from from the neutron star or from the from the companion onto the neutron star i am so sorry guys i'm getting distracted by these little signs popping up on my on my macbook here stating that i'm almost out of power because of the fact that my charger is not working as well as it should be but um so yeah th through these interactions between the neutron star and its companion this is also another means of being able to um in the in the effects that, that, that that's that's caused by the interaction between the two you can be able to observe neutron stars through those interactions as well now the last thing i wanted to go ahead and bring up was the fact that i was curious as i was um as i was trying to find images as i was scrambling to find images for today's um talk about neutron stars i was really curious about exactly well how many neutron stars would exist um in in the milky way galaxy and so before doing that though i'm going to quickly look at some of these um other questions i'm seeing here oh hanny that is a very good question so is the outer crust the reason for the magnetic field um and you know what, Hanny? I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not even too sure about that. I was actually asked this qu this question a very, very long time ago when I was giving a talk about um about ultra high energy cosmic rays and their possible sources. And if you guys were to if you guys were to go to Wikipedia and or, or Google Google and type in Helis Helis criterion for cosmic rays, basically um it's um not a theory but it's it's a way of being able to determine what are the possible types of sources for ultra high energy cosmic way cosmic rays and it's based off of the physical size of the source as well as um the strength of its magnetic field and so it just so happens that neutron stars are made made the cut essentially for being able to produce ultra high energy cosmic rays and someone asked me the question <laughs> given the given the fact that neutron stars are for the most part primarily con composed of neutrons um how exactly are they producing magnetic fields and of course um you know what comes to mind of course in order for you to produce a magnetic field you'd have to have a moving charge right maxwell's equations tells us this um and so you have these neutrons well somewhere in there well you don't just have neutrons actually you also have of course you have free electrons as well um but as to what exactly what sort of particles within the well free electrons and you also have um nuclei atomic nuclei mixed in there as well but um it's not it's, it's not really quite clear to me exactly what produces the magnetic field i would have to do some more reading up on that and i probably should have done some reading on it like well before the stream right given that this question was was like um, given to me like so so long ago but i honestly don't know um and given that you just brought it up I, i'm pretty sure i'm i'm not going to take the time to find out what the answer to that is let's see what other comments have i missed here let's see so yes all pulsars are neutron stars, but not all neutron stars are pulsars. Um, so Larry, you may say the sun's atmosphere goes out to the heliopause. I'm trying to remember, is the heliopause where the like is that where the termination shock is located? So um I'm thinking right now that for our solar system there is a region where the solar wind that is being produced by our sun flows out to some distance and eventually meets 
the um, particles that are primarily associated with um, the interstellar medium. And this location, this of course it has a lot to do with the pressure of those particles that are associated with the interstellar me medium um, pushing against the particles that are associ associated with um, the sun solar wind. And that m point at which they meet is, if I'm not mistaken, is, is the termination shock. And so is the heliopause that essentially that, that, that location of our solar, this is around our, our solar system? I'm wondering if that's the case. It's been a while since I've seen that word. But if that's the case, right? If if, if that's if you're if you're considering that to be the the, and I don't think that that's the, actually the the um, I don't think that's that I don't think that that particular distance corresponds is is, is associated with the um, sun's atmosphere. Um, that would be that would mean that we're encompassed within the sun's atmosphere. So I don't, I don't I don't think that that's the distance, but you said heliopause there, and I'm trying to remember what that term means. Hey, Rosin. So today we're talking about neutron stars. Um, I've kind of went through a, a, a lot of the stuff that I wanted to talk about with neutron stars. We've discussed um, how they're born. Um, we've discussed their interior. We've kind of talked a little bit, very briefly, about you know how they're detected. So let's see. Hanny asks, does the flux of neutrinos have something to do with the actual outward explosion of the supernova? So neutrinos are going to be produced within the um, supernova explosion itself. And so the neutrino well neutrinos and neutrons are are are, are different. Um, particles, types of particles. So the neutrino flux, I don't think, has anything to do exactly with the neutrons that compose the um, that compose the the neutron star itself. And just in case, to be to be clear, so the neutrinos are um, neutrinos are are, are one of the fundamental particles that are part of the standard model standard standard model. However, the, the neutrons are, um, are composite particles. They have a neutral charge. So, thank you, Astro. So that's the end of the sun's in influence. Is that what the um, heliopause is? So, is that, is that I'm, I'm trying to think, is that the correct way of thinking of it? The end of the sun, so the solar wind is directly related to the sun's, you know, sphere of influence. Um, and so I'm assuming that, yeah, the termination shock, of course, would have to be where the sun no longer can influence things, you know. it It's not the primary means of influencing any sort of, like, astronomical body. But the superconducting protons, there you go. I think, yeah, I think Larry hit it, head on the, hit it dead on the head there. Must be where m most of the uh, magnetism is coming from. And so, the very last thing I wanted to finish up with, with our discussion was, you know, we look out there into, to, into the sky, and we see all of these stars, of course, and I was wondering, well, how many of these stars are actually neutron stars? Um, and so, with that said, I'm going to bring up a, 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 a PDF document and this is actually a calculation that I made some time ago because um, I was curious. I wanted to see exactly how, well, how many neutron stars are there in our Milky Way, of course, given certain assumptions. So give me a quick second to set it up. And, well, it's already set up, but I just have to bring it back up. Let's see. Where are you? PDF. There we go. All right, and so our calculation for today is fraction of neutron stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And so um, here, are, are, and I'm going to kind of blow this up so it's a little bit bigger. All right, 
So hopefully I don't cut off too many things in doing so. All right. And so basically, um, to do the calculation, I've assumed a few things. One, I'm assuming, well, given given that um the neutron stars are essentially born from um main sequence stars that are somewhere within the mass range going as low as eight solar masses to about 20 to 25 solar masses. I've went on the safe side and I've just assumed, okay, well, I know for certain that a 10 solar mass star should produce a neutron star and that a 20 solar mass star should produce a neutron star. Now, the reason why I've chosen this particular mass range is because um, at eight solar masses, it is, a, it is the lowest mass that you can start to produce neutron stars. However, if I'm not mistaken, it's also possible that you can still produce um, another um, type of dead star, which is the white dwarf at, at, that, at that mass. So to be on the safe side, I decided to go with a 10 solar mass star because that particular type of mass solar star, mass main sequence star, excuse me, should, um, should definitely produce a neutron star. And this kind of the same um, reasoning with the 20 solar mass star, I know that once you start to get above 20 solar masses, somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, but somewhere within the 20-ish solar mass range, um, you can begin to start to produce, produce black holes. So um, 20 solar masses should definitely produce a neutron star. So I'm using that particular population of um, main sequence stars um, with my calculation. And the second assumption that I've stated here is that I'm assuming that all galact galactic stellar mass um, main sequence stars are somewhere within the range of 0.1 solar masses to roughly 90 solar masses when they're initially formed. So note that the calculation though, even though I'm not stating it here, this calculation does not take into consideration um, high mass stars or it doesn't take into consideration the production of new neutron stars after the initial production of, um, of stars within our galaxy. So um, the way in which I went about doing this is I'm using what's known as an initial mass function, which basically given, given some um, initial mass for some region of space, you can use that mass to determine the number of stars that you would be able to um, produce within a given mass um, range or bin. And it just so happens that this initial mass function, if you want, you can go ahead and look it up on Wikipedia. Um, it's a power law, and it's defined by the power law that we see here. dn over dm is proportional to the mass raised to some some power. Where in this situation, I'm using um, a, a spectral index that's that's common for um, this this mass function of 2.35, which is known as the Sol Peter. Um, this particular using this particular um, index is known as the Sol Peter initial mass function. And so I've taken this and and I know below it's gonna it's gonna kind of get to some other math that some people do not like. Um, in order for you to be able to use this, you're gonna have to use calculus um, to get to a final answer. And so, from there, I take my, my power law, my dn over dm, and essentially what I'm doing is I'm using calculus. I'm going to go ahead and solve or make a general solution for the number of stars that I would get that are somewhere within the mass range from m1 to m2. That's essentially what this bottom line is saying. So this line that I've highlighted here basically states that the number of stars that I will obtain within some mass range is equal to the equation here where M2 is the upper limit of the mass range and M1 is the lower limit of the mass range. You can forget everything else. Don't even worry about the math for it. If you want, you can go ahead and check it, but I think it's correct. <laughs> um, but this is what you're going to end up getting for the number of stars within that mass range where C is some constant of proportionality, which you'd be able to solve for if you had some sort of like initial conditions to work with. 
And so using this though, I can set up a, I can set up a fraction at the very least, where I'm basically stating this, that the fraction of neutron stars, of course, is going to be equal to the number the total number of neutron stars divided by the total number of stars within our galaxy. And this kind of ties into, of course, um, the the mass ranges that I, I I'm assuming early, assumed earlier for the um, for the production of neutron stars and the total number of stars within our galaxy. And essentially I end up getting that the fraction, my estimate was that the fraction of neutron stars within our galaxy is roughly about 0.1% of the total number of stars. And so with that in mind, and I think there's about somewhere between like a, well there's somewhere on the order of 100, 100 billion um, stars within our within our galaxy. And so, doing the math for that, 0.1% of 100 billion is, come on Matt, let's not mess this up, uh, is, uh, yeah, 100, 100 million stars. So 100 million neutron stars um, is, my, is my estimate. And of course, this is assuming though, that all the main sequence stars that are in the mass range from 10 solar masses to 20 solar masses they formed when um, when the Milky Way initially form, um, was was formed. Have all underwent a supernova type two explosion, so they've all essentially like been on the main sequence, went through their 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 red giant phase and have exploded and have left behind neutron stars. Now, I had time to go ahead and check this, and so I went to Wikipedia. And I typed in neutrons, or well, I went to Google and typed in new, how many neutron stars there were. Um, and the Wikipedia article showed up. And so I read through it, and it turns out that my estimate is like exactly, it, it, it perfectly agrees with what they, um, they state to be the, um, the estimate for neutron stars within our galaxy. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, their estimate, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how did they, how did they get their estimate. Of course, it came from observations, and mine is kind of more of like an analytical approach. Um, can't I find it? Oh, wait, hold on. I see the, no, it's Matt's microphone. Is there a problem with my mic? So let me quickly, yes, I'm going to quickly scroll through the comments here. So yeah, Hanny, to quickly answer your question, is there a way to detect neutron stars that are not pointing at us? Um, the only other means of being able to detect neutron stars that are not pointing at us, from my understanding, is if they're in a binary system. And it's the interactions between the neutron star and its companion that will produce an effect that we can see or observe. So, the pro so Larry's question about the protons in the outer core, are they held solely by gravity, or does the strong force play a role? So in this situation, um, you're asking about two of the fundamental forces, well, two of the four fundamental forces, gravity and strong force. Now, I, I don't think, I don't think the strong force is the, is the situation here. I think it's solely by gravity. Because the strong force only acts acts on um, a certain length scale, it's extremely small. Um, I think the strong force is, is related to how atoms are held together. However, these protons are going to be um, pretty much in a, in a, or the nuclei themselves, the nuclei would have protons that are held together by the strong force. But if you just have free protons, um, well they're just free protons. The, the, the protons of the nuclei would be held together by the strong force, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the, the free protons themselves would just be there, you know, due to the, the gravity of the, of, the, of the neutron star itself. Everything there is there due to the gravity of the, of the neutron star. Oh, that is one thing I did forget to mention. Right. How the, how the neutron stars um, support themselves from, from, from collapsing. Um, so... The overall effect that neutron stars um, that's associated with the neutron star 
the overall effect that stops the neutron star from collapsing on itself is the same effect for, for white dwarfs as well. Um, and it's it's due to the Pauli exclu exclusion principle, which basically um, which basically states that that two or more fermions cannot share the same quantum state. Um, specifically, the effect with neutron stars is known as neutron neutron degeneracy pressure, and for white dwarfs, it's electron degeneracy pressure. Um, but that's what stops them from from collapsing. But hopefully, I answered your question earlier. Larry about what, what, what keeps the um, protons, you know, within the outer core. I, I'm pretty sure it's just pr primarily gravity. Let's see. Oh, that sounds pretty cool, actually. Larry states here that a, that a very fast exoplanet was found circling a neutron star. Hey, Pharaoh. We are talking about neutron stars, as Hanny stated there. <laughs> well, welcome to today's stream, 2K My Team Police. So, what sort of sound interference are you guys hearing here? Um, yeah, right now I'm using my external mic. So how much more pressure is involved in a neutron star versus a white dwarf? Um, okay. I would say that as far as how much more, I'm not too sure, but the pressure is defined by a pol, a pol uh, what's it, what is it? A, pol, a poly, I learned this back in stellar, stellar astrophysics. Um, Polytropic, polytropic relationship. Give me a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly look. At, but basically, the pressure is, is dependent upon the, just the density, versus like with the main sequence star, the pressure is dependent upon the temperature and density. Um, but basically, white dwarfs and neutron stars included are polytropes. So I'm gonna quickly make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm saying that right. But I think it's polytropic relationship. Let's see. Polytropic. Let's see. Polytropic process. Polytropes. So I was taking a quick moment to, to look that up, but I think that the pressure is primarily due to the density, and if that's the case, then that would mean that the pressure of a, of a, of a neutron star is higher, because they're, they're more dense than white dwarfs. And I am having a hard time. Let's see. Polytrope. And I'm just going to type in neutron star. See what it gives me. Ha! Polytrope. There we go. Yes, I, I think I think that that's the case. So if you type in polytrope and you go to, to, to the Wikipedia article for it, um, I'm reading here that yeah, the pressure is um is proportion essentially proportional to the density to some power, which we're just say gamma. It's, it's it's proportional to k times the density to the gamma power. And so, if your density is higher, as I'm reading this, so if n is, is so, if if I'm reading this correctly, if n is positive, that's a positive. Yeah, density is higher, your pressure is higher, and I do know that a that a, a neutron star's density is higher than that of a, of a white dwarf's. Let's see, static, whatever. I am so sorry, guys, if, if my voice sounds staticky. Maybe I should move away from the mic. Um, oh, 
Agreed, Hanny. Gravity is very weak, right? But the situation, like you just said, gravity is a lot. Just thinking about the um, the gravitational force equation, right? It's proportional to the ma to, to the mass that's involved, and it's also dependent, of course, upon one over r squared. So. So, Guido, you're more than likely right because I did try to play around with my settings, my OBS settings, hoping to make the stream go a little bit smoother. It, when it comes to this, like this, tech, the technical side of of these streams, my my abilities to to do well in that category is just really, really, it's not, it's not so great. But yeah, to answer your question though, it has. A, a, a neutron star has more pressure. So do we understand gravity at this level? Um, I mean, with um, with our understanding of... Yeah, we, uh, we definitely don't know what's happening like at the singularity of a black hole, right? Um, but... With our understanding of general relativity, I, well, given the information we get from gener general relativity, I think we have a pretty good understanding of gravity at the um, at the the level of, of of as far as neutron stars are concerned. But yeah, this is um. But yeah, I was I was gonna say something about the about the fraction I was able to the the estimate I was able to get. So, and to do so, I just need to quickly pull up that Wikipedia article. Let's see. There we go. Nope, not neutron, but neutron star. So in the Wikipedia article for Neutron Star, it, it hopefully it loads soon. Come on, you can do it. There we go. All right. So, all right. So it's the one, two, three, fourth paragraph for the Wikipedia article for Neutron Star. It states there are thought to be around 100 million neutron stars in the Milky Way. And that this figure is obtained by estimating the number of stars that have undergone supernova explosions. Now, of course, in order to, it sounds like in order for you to, for them to get at this figure, they have to figure out a rate of supernova explosions. And of course, in this situation, I believe they're talking. They'd have to be talking about supernova type two explosions, and not the type one A. So, with figuring out that rate. Multiplying that rate by some time, you get a total number of um, of neutron stars um, produced. Um, and I just found it very interesting that given given the method that they're they they're using, my estimate kind of gives you know like the same order of magnitude as their is their um is their estimate, and I kind of found that pretty pretty cool actually. Now I'm pretty sure there's some things I'm not considering. Um, but I did, I did find it pretty pretty cool though. Um, okay, that's right, Larry. Thank you, Larry, for the for the um for the correction. So gravity is not weak. Yeah, gra in fact, gravity always wins. <laughs> as far as forces are concerned, gravity always wins. Um, and it, and it's, as Larry states here, um, whenever you're talking about about the fundamental forces, not so. It's not so much that their their strengths are highly dependent upon the um, scale over which you're talking about. Um, 
if you're talking, of course, about things that are spaced really, really far apart, like for exact, for example, like on galactic scales and stuff like that, um, especially on galactic and extra galactic scales, then yeah, gravity is the thing that you're going to be most concerned with as far as forces are concerned. Um, however, as you begin to go go to smaller scales, of course, um, the other fundamental forces begin to take over. So it really depends, like like Larry states, about the range you're talking about. The range and length between things you're talking about. Yep, exactly as Hanny states there. You know what? I'm probably going to end up having it. Well, when Joe returns, more than likely... I'm going to be handing over the sh handing the stream back over to him, you know, to host and stuff like that because his setup is is so much better than mine's. So I envy his setup, and I'm talking about, of course, his um his computer setup for the streams. But let's let's make sure that I haven't missed any any other questions here. And if I haven't All right. So I don't think I've missed any other questions here, guys. The time's about 1.22 p.m. And I know for some of you, it's 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 fairly late, and you're probably gonna like head to bed soon. Well, then again, it's the weekend. <laughs> I know that I'm probably uh, well. It's the middle of the day for me here. I'm in I'm in the Central Time Zone, so here in Clarksville, Tennessee. So if I don't see any more questions, okay, guys. Oh wait, up. Oh, Astro has something to say here. So per the math, per the math, math equation, if there are a billion stars in the Milky Way. Um, if there are a billion stars. So yeah, let me just quick, yeah, billion, 10 to the 9, 0.1% is 10 to the negative 3. So yeah, there should be 10 to the 6, which is a million, which you have there. Yeah, there would be a million stars, a million neutron stars, yeah. That is correct. But then again, I mean, the assumption, of course, is that all of, the, and this is all based off of how many main sequence stars um, are going to be able to, you know, produce the neutron stars? Oh no, no, your math is your math is dead on. And so, I've, of course, I've assumed that all of those main sequence stars will definitely become neutron stars, and they have become neutron stars. So the other factor that I'm not talking about here is time, right? Um, the initial mass function, of course, takes takes some amount, total amount of mass, and from that, lets you know how many stars in total you're going to get um, as a function of mass. And so, and I'm quickly losing where, I'm, where I was going with this. Um, Right, so it, it lets, the, the initial mass function will let you know the, num the total number of stars you're going to get within some given mass range. But the key thing is time though, right? If only, let's say if only a thousand years have passed since um, I initially formed my stars, then I would have no neutron stars, right? Because, because main sequence stars, in fact all main sequence stars, last longer than a thousand years. But if you're talking about over the age of um, 
for example, the Milky Way, um, then yeah, of course, the, the, all, all the all of those stars that initially formed, you know, like what is it, like 13 billion years ago, um, all all the high mass stars at the very least have more than likely died, and have went through the red giant phase and have become. It's been long enough for them to beca have beca become neutron stars. Yes, Hanny, that is that is so correct. So whenever whenever you have a region of space um, in which you know the mass contain, and I'm talking of course on galactic scales, um, you have a region of space, um, a star forming region of space, in which you know the mass of that star forming region. Um, you can use an initial mass function to determine the number of stars you have within a given mass um, mass range. And you get a distribution of, of, of those um of those of that of that number. So you can essentially histogram it. But in this mass band we get so many number of of um of, of stars. But in this mass band we get so many number of stars. Well, guys, I had a great time today with our discussion about neutron stars. If you guys have any ideas, um, well, if you guys have any ideas and you have access to the Weekly Space Hangout Crew Slack um, Slack channel, then by all means, um, post something there, and hopefully, I get to see it and probably talk about it. I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you, Astro. I kind it, it kind of gives me gets me down whenever there's like you know sort of like production issues on my end, and I I'm unable to like really fix it. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off here, and I will see you guys next week on Wednesday. If I'm not mistaken, I think I think next week we're gonna be working at at a different time. Um, I need to verify that. But yeah, guys, have a great weekend, and I will see you guys next week after after, after Daily Space. Wow. Okay, guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>